अभी तो क्या मेडिकल
important just in Europe after it was invented in the, in the West of France specifically, in, uh, sort of went through in such a huge way that we were astonished by the number of studios across the length and breadth of the country which worked, which uh, have a huge amount of resources of photographic material available even now. And the earliest photographs that we have are something called a very peculiar type called daguerreotype. I'm not going to get into too many details of the types of photographs, just going to run through the visuals you see and the way people, especially royal clients, were patronized by patronized studios and were photographed and looked at. Uh, the style of posing is what is really extraordinary here. From the beginning of the story to the end of the story, you'll see that they were away in remote isolation and towards the end in the 20th century, at the time of independence, they became much more accessible and with a lot of people around them too. So this is something that comes through across the archives and you look at it. Nawab Wajid Ali Shah most of you are very familiar with this story, but not few, not many people know that a series of photographs of him were taken, but this one is with his wife and his children. And with this is with one of his daughters. There are several subsequent photographs that were taken of him. We unfortunately only have uh, very bad copy prints available because where the original archive went, we still don't know. We are told it's somewhere in Scotland, but that's a mystery that still needs to be solved. As you look through these photographs, you realize that this is the height of a Muslim court which was not in Partha, which was not in seclusion, and photography was, had just come into the fore. And what's really interesting here is Vajradari himself is looking away and his wife is looking into the camera. It's, it's kind of extraordinary. You start thinking that we've heard so many stories of women in the Zanana, what kind of lives they led, did they have any influence in court at all? And I'm telling you, I'm not telling you that make an argument just based on this, on this photograph, but start thinking that perhaps other things were going on too that we don't know well enough. And to know all of that well enough, we need to start looking at different forms of archives, we need to start looking at other records, not just the historical work, and the stunts that still needs to be done. Another Begum of it, this is uh, of uh, Vajdari Shah, this is particularly interesting because she is photographed and posed within a framework uh, of how she was painted as well. So you have painting in the State Museum in Lucknow where she's within the same format and then you have a photograph pasted into the same format. So the transfer from painting to photography is pretty clear here. You start getting a semblance that painters were also contributing to photography and as you go through the book and as you study the history of photography in India, you realize that painters were some of the first people who trained as photographers in India. Again, an early example, 1858, Dennis Strike, a very extraordinary photographer who's known for his photographs of temple architecture in India, all across the uh, south in, in the kingdom of Burma. He took an extensive lot of photographs. This is one of his rarer portraits which was taken. And in 1858, when you see the photographic document, you see the king at the center of the stage. But if you look at the guy standing right behind him, that is his prime minister. And under the rules of what was going on in the state under British control, it was such that the power had completely been vested in the minister and not in the king himself. And if you look at the photograph, you sort of can see that even though the king is signing the document, it is actually the minister who holds the center stage in the photograph. Photographs have the immediacy of getting you connected to a story, to seeing more than what you just see. But when we started a systematic study of archives in India, we realized that archives hold the key because you have several photographs coming together. So you have not just the one iconic shot, but perhaps a few taken before that, perhaps a few taken after that. And when you start connecting these archives, you realize that similar images were being used, similar styles of photography were being used. One assumed that women were not photographed, and that's not true, women were photographed. At the same time, certain stereotypes do hold. Uh, Rajput quotes, especially quotes like Devo, did have a single photograph of a lady till 1940. And the only photograph they had were of dancing girls and courtesans, and these were actually cut in some of the earliest forms of photographs where they were being publicized and transferred through. Other uses photographs were initially put to was to create, you know, lithographs and woodcut prints. Uh, we've had a phenomenon where photographs were taken into the a studio and they were converted into prints. So you see the different kinds of uses that photographs are being put to. The British were very smart in that sense that they decided that a surveying of the country had to be done. You needed a, the entire kingdom to be, the entire colonial state to be documented. And they are the ones who really encourage some of the most important for photographers to sort of come in and start the practice. Different styles of photography. Now this photograph is particularly poignant because if you look at 
on our on his own. He's seen with the paraphernalia which stands behind him. You see the uh, morcha, which is the peacock feather fan held behind him, which is to indicate that this is a sovereign. When the shift came from painting to photography, some of those modes still continued. And you had photographers getting their royal patrons posed in the same style as they would have been for a painting. Maharaja Ram Singh of Jaipur was an extraordinary ruler, but as many of you may be aware, he was also a very important photographer for the state of Jaipur. His archives are existing in the city palace Jaipur, and uh, for, we've been very fortunate that in the last one year, we managed to catalog and document the entire collection. Soon, we'll be seeing shows, exhibitions, and books coming. So the fact that more and more archives are opening up is very interesting. Here you have an example of a regular photograph and a painted photograph. And painted photographs are a particular Indian trait that soon became popular all across princely India. It was perhaps not good enough to be documented in black and white. In India, when everything is so much about color, vigor, and vitality, rulers decided to employ their painters, the court painters, who now had a lesser function to some extent, decided they would come back into the game by starting to paint over photographs. So it, this does not mean that it's a copy of a photograph, it means that there's a layer of painting over a photograph. And there were several different kinds of photographs which were being done in this time. Two superb examples of painted photographs. The one on the left is Maharaja Madhusing again of Jaipur. The reason I've shown you these two contrasting images is because the first is in the high court tradition of the traditional image of painter painting in the court of the exact details which are going into the photograph. Whereas the one on the right is an enlargement of a photograph and then painted over in the bazaar style. So you see the more florid or lurid colors coming in. You see the way he's painted over. And the original which also exists in the Udaipur archives is actually a tiny Kathya which is not as big. It is just like this big. And this image was enlarged sometime in the 1860s and subsequently painted over. Maharaja Prithvi Singh of Kishangar, I'm trying to show a range of Rajput rulers pictures from the book. The book has images from across India, but I'm sticking to more uh, images which perhaps resonate with audiences in Jaipur. And they would realize that Rajputana, for reasons of being far more visible in the British Raj, seems to have appropriated photography almost uh, to become a format of statecraft where they aped the British rulers. They, if albums were being made for the Viceroy, albums were being made for the Rajput rulers. Uh, the only other state you see this to a great extent in India is Hyderabad, and not too many other states do you get to see this kind of photographic case happening. This is again how a regular print was converted into a painted approximation. And if you look at the painted uh, depiction, the painted photograph, you see the small curl, the carpet painted on. This is a very clever take on a Jaroka view of the with a painted textiles right below his arm because the emperor is visualized in the painting you see textiles right below him. So the painted, the artist who painted over the photograph decided to add the extra detail. <laughs> this image and the next image are two um, very interesting photographs in contrast because this tells you the exact skill that a painted, uh, a paint, uh, an artist who painted over photographs has. So if you see this photograph, you see that it's exactly the same picture. Now look at the fidelity to detail. Every detail has been filled in lovingly, every detail has been added. And what's really interesting is most of the main characters in the photograph, in the montage, are, are labeled and named below the photograph. Uh, this is something again peculiar to Udaipur. We see that uh, in the history of paintings in Udaipur, there were huge annotations and inscriptions behind each of the paintings explaining the stages of work, if it was a, a landscape painting, if it was a portrait it mentioned, who had, whose portrait it was, who had painted it, what price they had acquired it. We find the same level of detail when you look at these photographic archives. Sometimes you have the name of the photographer or you have a seal or a stamp. In some cases you know what price the court paid to acquire these photographs. This image and again the next one is something which is Interesting, and you only realize the context because you see it in an archive. If you were to see this in isolation, you see a young prince of Jodhpur, very, a very focused, seated on a throne. But it's when you see the next image that you realize what was happening. So, if we did not have the benefit of being able to look at the archive in an entirety, we would miss out on how these photo shoots were happening, what were the backdrops, who were the people standing next to the uh, uh, patron, 
photographic is much more is especially difficult in places like Hyderabad. We have very complicated photo shoots where, in some cases, in the archive we glimpse a bit of a sleeve of a ruler, and we realize from other photographs that this was the is now himself standing in the same room and his children were being photographed. So the archive tends to give you a lot of information on the culture of photographic studios, how these images were being shot, how they were. How they were printed, what were the different formats being put up from small to medium to large, and the circulation of these images. They were often given as autograph gifts when uh, royal uh, visitors from across the world came. We know that the Prince of Wales definitely tended to visit India. Every 15, 20 years, you had a British Prince of Wales war tracing and traveling through the country, and he would be given gifted portraits, signed portraits by different rulers, and he in turn would give them. And in these archives, we are signing, seeing both. This is a small example. On the left, you see the Nizam with his children, and exactly two years later, you see his prime minister with his children. So you sort of see the aping of styles. And earlier, to starting the conversation, I was having a discussion with Deborah, and she said, "You see this in painting too. The ruler would start doing something, and soon the court and the gentle, uh, the." Uh, crowd around the city would start following or aping that signature style. And this is captured in the photographic archives as well. I wonder if there's a greater story of continuum from painting to photography that we perhaps need to look at now that more and more archives are being made available. Women photography is essentially seen more towards uh, Western and Southern India. In the Rajput states, like I said before, strict parda was enforced and you do not have lots of pictures. Exceptions are there. States like Bikaner uh, definitely had slightly more enlightened and less conservative rulers who encouraged photography, who encouraged uh, women in the family to be photographed. So that's you have it. But generally, the bulk of women photographed were from the Maratha states. These two photographs are simply extraordinary because the lady of the left, Rani Kanadi of Kapurthala, her husband was a Francophile, and he was, she was constantly dressed like a French lady when she traveled. And this you see her with a child, and completely dressed as a European lady. And on the right you have the remarkable example of the Maharani of God, but God is a tiny state in uh, Gujarat, where she's staring in, she, this is the photograph taken in the Lafayette studio, which in the early 20th century was a very important photographic studio in England. Uh, whenever the princely states, uh, the rulers and the extended families went visiting, they went to the fire studio and had their portraits taken. A lot of British royalty was doing it, so they sent them to follow suit. She's staring into a book, and in certain kinds of photography, we've seen that when an open book or a gaze is shown when they're looking, it's almost to convey that the woman is educated or that she's a woman of learning, that she comes from a family which believed that learning was so. The premium on showing that they were not conservative but more progressive was always on, on all kinds of visual representation, and you've got to see that in photography as well. These are two examples from an album by the Puna Photography Company. This is a, um, very remarkable because almost a hierarchy of rulers has been created in the image on the right. Uh, you have Queen Victoria and you have the major princes all circulated and uh, all um, overlinked and put into the frame. And what really happened here is that the precedence of the prince state was from the 21 guns in Hyderabad down to 19, 17, 16, and 15. And albums seemed to follow this careful choreography because you had the 19 guns and photographers, the rulers right up front, then you had the others and then the third and so on and so forth. So clearly precedence was something that studios understood. Precedence was something that studios wanted to depict in their albums, and these were subsequently commercially sold, and they were available for people to buy. One of the only photographs of women we see in Udaipur, uh, this is uh, uh, the photograph of the Maharaja of Jodhpur, but the reason this is in the Udaipur archive, we are not sure which queen, but one of the queens was the princess of Udaipur. So that's consequently how this image came back to but if you look carefully, the backdrop is a European, uh, a completely European landscape which is being seen. Photographic studios use all kinds of landscapes, and that's an entire new subject that needs to be really worked on. Again, a few examples of different modes. This is the taken of the coronation of Maharaja Ranjit Singh of Jamnagar, but since the photographer could actually enter the ritual area, the scene was enacted later, and you had this photograph taken. So there were certain areas where photography was not allowed, so you had to go out of it and then get the photograph taken. An example of uh, a photograph from the Punjab Hill State is the smaller princely states. Some of these photographs were taken by 
photographers from the Archaeology Survey of India who travels to these remote areas and were capturing and documenting the archaeological treasures of the country. They seem to have gone across and photographed a lot of our uh, personages from the region as well. Coming back to Hyderabad, to extraordinary images of the Nizam's children decked in the Nizam's jewels. This is the huge collection which is currently at the National Museum in storage, of course, it hasn't been seen for the last five or six years. But you also see huge depictions and similar. Uh, you can understand the way clothing culture, jewelry culture, material culture evolved in these societies, how clothes were worn, how jewels were worn. Because today we only have complicated names. We don't necessarily understand the usage and how these uh, objects were used in everyday life. Photographs give you some kind of a clue. They don't, may not always tell you everything that you want to know, but they, they definitely help you sort of get into the field and figure out what was used. For example, we have things which were termed as bracelets, but we realized later that they were actually anklets. So things like that. It, it's helping other forms of study in art history. It's helping jewelry studies. It's helping a lot of. So the examining of these archives has been quite important. Page boys for the king and queen taken to the, the bar of. 1911, you can see the entire range of princely states whose children were sent to be photographed and be page boys to the king and queen. But it's also important to realize that at this stage, by the states who are not shown in the photograph, the absence is actually more important because a lot of states who did not agree with the Delhi Darbar refused to allow their children to go for this as well. So you obviously can look and interpret the people who were there, but there's a greater study on the people who were not seen there as well. Hyderabad, I keep going back to this because there is this myth almost of, or rather an Orientalist fantasy that women were completely uh, secluded and kept away. And women held a huge, uh, held a very important role in court. And in many of PR, I feel there's an almost controlled activities that happen. They planned marriage alliances, they helped interpret and control finances of the state. In times of war, they managed. Uh, uh, the state funds, there was lots of activity going on. In Hyderabad in 1915, it's an unprecedented example where a series of photographs of the women of the Zanana were taken by the Nizam, the Dindaya studios were commissioned. And for the first time, because the photo, photo session was happening inside one of the palaces, a lady photographer was taken in. So these photographs were taken by a, a lady photographer hired by the Dindaya studios who went to uh, court and took these pictures. A painted photograph, which is also the front cover of the uh, book, uh, shows the Viceroy with Prince Bhopal Singh and the dog. And the dog seems to be sort of dominant feature coming always out of the frame. And we checked up because we looked up other photographs of Lord Harding's visit in Hyderabad, in uh, Orcha, and we realized that the dog was his, it was not Prince Bhopal Singh's dog. So it seems the Viceroy traveled with his dogs through his tours. One of the finest photographs we have in the book. Uh, it almost presupposes films to me. I mean, I think if you look at how a cinema shot is panned, this is probably what sort of gives you a uh, complete uh, sense of the scale at which photography could be. But do remember that something like this is fairly complicated because you have a large casting group of people and these photographs need to be taken very fast because the longer they stayed on, there was a shake and uh, then you got a, a completely blurred image. These are some more quickly run through the pictures so that again from Jaipur trick photography for all of you who think photoshopping happened now, this is to tell you that glass plate negatives could be manipulated in any which way. Photographs of rulers in the 1940s when they were being exposed and captured by the camera's lens in a slightly more western gaze. How painted photographs came up for came up to the court. You have several iterations, and then the court decided which one they wanted printed. And the last images of the princess of Berar in Hyderabad was actually the daughter of the last caliph of Turkey who got married into the Hyderabad family. And these are two. The, the, the bigger picture on the left is taken by Margaret Bo when she came to India. This is the last picture, and the reason I'm showing this is to tell you that. While a lot of dodging was happening in photography, the backdrop is complete fantasy by S. Thakkar Singh who painted over these photographs and Thakkar Singh is known for his landscape paintings. So he happily introduced an entire new landscape in a portrait which was taken in the studio. 
you can go back to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have just have a few questions. One is text about photography, the history of photography itself is only a few decades old. And since the 1980s, one of the questions uh, in the field of Indian photography, the history of Indian photography has been, is this, is photography Western? Is photography transnational? Is there a particular way of Indian seeing? Um, these are the things that have been debated by scholars, and I'm wondering if, with the insights of these vast new archives, if you have a new sense on local, translocal, transnational Indian. Uh, looking at the archives, one of the clear indications we get is that portraiture is clearly the dominant form of photography. Everybody wants a portrait taken. Of course, court scenes and uh, rites of passages were recorded, visits were recorded. But portraits were the dominant form. And the other great learning we are now seeing is that when we look at the painted photographs, particularly in Makara, the fact that there were so many different iterations of most of the paintings also gives us a great sense that, I mean, the Western style of photography where you see a backdrop used or a palace interior used as a backdrop for a photography clearly is existed as well. But the bulk of the photographs that we see in Indian archives has painted backdrops, has got some kind of uh, a, a sort of almost studio-like creation. It's not the real living space which is often depicted. It's almost like if a photograph had to be taken at court, you couldn't do it in a room where your normal activity went on. You went to a separate and extra place where the studio was created, and that's where you got done. And the results of it which then came out in the front in the archives, where you see the number of photographs, almost give you a sense that it clearly was, because of the, the speed of the process, it became a huge thing for people to want to do it more. And I'm not sure if this really answers your question. But I'm not sure there really is an answer to that question. Um, but I'll, I'll try it again from another angle. Is there, can you talk about continuities or, or discontinuities between court painting, the dominant genre in Indian court painting, whether Google, Rajput, wherever, has been portraiture? And this, there's a switch in technology to photography, and the dominant genre is portraiture. So, are there disruptions or continuities between court painting and court photography? Uh, surprisingly, essentially, it is continuity. Uh, in most of the archives, if you look back at their painting uh, history, you see that uh, buildings and uh, landscapes are shown, you have portraits of uh, rulers, and when you come into photography, you start to see the same things. You have some of the landscapes captured, with some of the court events captured, meetings of different rulers captured in photographs, and you start seeing portraits again. So continuities does have certainly seem to exist. What seems to have vanished is the, uh, the element of fantasy of getting uh, great detailed carpets in the foreground, great details of moods and aesthetics, like if you have a Paramasa series where you have cloud details or a particular bird depicted, or a particular scene, if you have the Hindola Raga, you have the swing. Whereas in a photograph, you wouldn't see that. So a lot of the poetic themes which are being used for uh, painting seem to have kind of gone off it. And it's only, a, it just remains a more documentary format rather than a poetic depiction of trying to cap capture the ambient energy of what's going on at court. You have also mentioned statecraft in, in Rajasthan. And how photographs become a part of statecraft. So the assumption then is that they're collected and distributed. Uh, that's an American, I think, of baseball cards. But um, they're collected and distributed to sort of articulate rank, prestige, and status. So do we know how these photographs were actually circulated? Um, and yeah, why, if, if they were made to be circulated as part of statecraft, would you have 40,000 photographs in storerooms in Bhutan um, today? What's really interesting we found is we've been able to isolate a few early studios who were doing these uh, photographic, for early photographic studios who were going across Prince and they are taking these pictures. And um, bulk of the albums that you see in the archives, both in India and across the world, are products of photographs that came out of these studios. But the arrangement of them tends to be similar. We 
starting point in the 1870s and late 1880s, the studio started mass producing these and these albums were being purchased by royal houses. And whether they were just for the pleasure of looking through photographs, uh, we don't know because they're still there, a few of them are there. But the extraordinary thing about portraits is that if hundreds of portraits got uh, ordered, why are they still in the archives? If they were not being circulated, what was the purpose of having this? This is something that we still haven't been able to completely ex explain. At least the portrait bit. The album bit, I can still understand to a great extent. And also, when I mentioned statecraft, there was actually another angle which came in. Because the premium of on wanting to be seen as forward and progressive was so high, that a lot of states created albums of the great and the good of their states. So you had the Baroda album, which showed the public garden of Baroda, it showed the University of Baroda, it showed the Museum of Baroda, it showed the Hospital of Baroda. And these were albums which were then gifted to the visiting viceroy, almost like telling him, don't uh, come in and rock the boat with the state, we are fine, we are progressive, look at us, this is all that's happening. And we see multiple copies of such albums being exchanged back and forth between various states, sent to their, either through the political agent's office, to the viceroy, or back home to the, to, to the queen, or to the king as the case. So the use of albums in station after use, but finally the little Kadivizit albums that these rulers had, where they had different kinds of portraits of the other rulers in the region, seems interesting because we see the same portraits. So if an album had 60 pictures, I would see the same, essentially more or less, give or take a few images in Hyderabad, in Udaipur, but the order in which they would be put would be slightly different. And this could be because I know certain rulers better, so I would probably have their photograph up front and then the others below, behind them. And again, there is a sort of tradition of this in England where Queen Victoria and Albert, Prince Albert maintained vast Kadivizit albums where they kept photographs of all their dominions, including of India. And maybe this is something that many states want to do in I have one more broader question before we open this, um, and that's, I think I'm right on these years. Fifteen years ago, painted photographs were not considered art, they weren't studied by scholars, they weren't collected in museums. And if you, were, if you knew about them and you were interested in them and you came to India and you wanted to see them, regardless of who you were, you might not be allowed in to look at them. They would be considered private or they were locked in a room and somebody had lost the key sometime um, before independence. So, what has changed? Why is there strong interest in photography in India today, both contemporary and uh, pre-independence? You know, are those two things related? Why, all of a sudden, um, are family collections opening up, you know, to you to make them to publish and make them available for everybody? And why is there international interest? Well, it's actually. Um, it's interesting you ask the question because I can tell you honestly for the princely states who have now converted their homes and palaces because they need to be maintained as hotels, um, the fact that their collections are catalogued and more accessible to visitors means that you have people who want to stay on for some more time and look through these archives. Also this allows a great deal of study to happen within their archives and you have publications, exhibitions, so outreach potential is huge for them and consequently you get a huge number of people getting to know about remote archives as well. So that's one clear pecuniary interest which I think allows them. Of course, it also expands their myth of us being great kings and this being our archives and we've always been patrons of art. In fact, if you look up here, you see some amazing examples of painted photographs up on the walls of this hall as well. Um, the other thing is that painted photographs for the longest time were considered paintings. Most people didn't realize that there were photographs below them. And as each medium of photography changed from the albumin print to the uh, silver gelatin to platinum prints, the technique of painting got more and more refined. And in the early 20th centuries, when there was a huge burgling of this, and almost every ruler worth his name had multiple colored images of them done. And paintings had sort of were not being done a lot. Courts clearly had a tradition of paintings existing which had died out and perhaps this was a way to substitute that way and saying that okay, we may not be doing paintings anymore but we at least have painted photographs. And I also feel that in India, definitely uh, painted photographs made far more attractive pictures 
uh, than just, I mean, the Zika pictures were not as attractive as the pictures for X1. So clearly there was a, there was a visual reason why, an aesthetic reason why people wanted to look at it. Families now wanting to come out and do this because photography is a far more accessible medium. Every youngster understands it. All of us have mobile phones, we take photographs all the time. It is something that everybody can connect with. You don't need to know the history of the painting to be able to understand the painting. You read the history to get it. You might appreciate it purely on a visual level, but to get into the depth of the painting, you would need to know far more. Whereas the photograph is far, it's immediate, it's more accessible. And that's why I think it's become far more popular, both the historic work and the contemporary. Uh, I think we're really lucky to be having this conversation in this particular room. Um, because if you look around, there are uh, princely family photographs and painted photographs on the walls around us, giving us some sense of how paintings were, well, paintings that were considered important and valuable and how they were displayed. So that, I hope, inspires you to ask really good, hard questions of promote. Uh, imitated uh, paintings in 
topography and hand color and our back and forth images. But then there was this radical break with Edward Weston and his cohorts. Did a moment like that ever occur in Indian photography? There's no, there's no one particular moment where that would have occurred. I don't, we haven't seen any sort of groundbreaking event where there is this, this sort of shift happened. I don't really see that. But I do notice that it's the proliferation of the images, the painted image, definitely starts from the 1860s onwards, which is about 20 years after photography came into country. And also remember, some of the older photographs were painted much later. So an image might have been taken in 1860, and it may have been painted in 1920. So that complicates the issue, the issue for us because then are you looking at, then you have to start looking at pigment colors from the 20th century as against from the late 19th century. And I was also telling you that some of the late paintings in certain courts, especially in courts like Udaipur, in the large panorama paintings, you have a photographer inserted into the painting as well, with his box camera and black cloth. So the photographer itself was being documented in the last phase of painting. So the continuity was quite huge actually. Now, 
the, the, for example, the short, chubby, hirsute torso um, appears not only on portraits of kings, but then on portraits of gods. So then at a certain point, Shiva, you know, has a big pot belly and it's quite hairy and looks just like the body of the king. So I don't think we know what the body of the king meant at any given moment, but I just encourage Provo, please, to go back and, and work on this most photographed of, of kings. And also remember in the 1930s and 40s when he was the absolute ruler, the times were different. Uh, access, the way you behave towards ruler was very different from across from our in the democratic process we are in now. And I don't think people would have even considered saying that he's not a good looking I think then if it was discussed, it would have been said in very harsh tones, never sort of brought out to the fore. And he was very well liked in the state because he was far more progressive than his father was an extremely conservative ruler who had ruled for 45 years. So all of a sudden, even though you had it in whatever way, it was a change and a departure from what had already existed. So the link of 
always continued to a great extent, and they started painting over photographs, but the mediums changed. You couldn't really use watercolors on uh, platinum prints, for example. You, you could use it on album. And so technically, if you had a problem, then you sort of changed and played around. And if the miniature artist knew that difference, he or she could do it in a, in a better way. The painting could be better. But um, we definitely see a lot of connection between the miniature artist and the painter who was working on the painted photographs. He clearly came from a tradition. I think of it as a kick back to an older tradition which continued in his new form. One of the things that I understood from your work, though, was painted photography, the te techniques of painted photography come out of Europe to India, because the handbooks of use this paint for this type of photograph come out of Europe. But, now this is like a test to see if I got this right. But, one of the things that happens in India, and not in Europe, as far as we know, is that there are what we thought for years were painted photographs coming out of Indian courts. They're totally made out of paint. It's almost as if it, there's no photographs, photographic substrate. It's as if it's an aesthetic. Um, you know, a sort of photorealism, you know, begins in India. Um, so that, that seems to be sort of an Indian response, whether it means that they're treating it as a style or an aesthetic, whether that aesthetic is a signifier of modernity, whether it's about expediency, I don't think we know yet. But that's from your work is how I understood one of the differences. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean you're quite spot on there actually. And even the popular artists like Raja Ravi Varma who were painting portraits of rulers, in many a case, like you know his portrait of the Nizam of Hyderabad could not have been from, uh, from uh, from the Nizam having sat for the portrait because we know for a fact that the Nizam refused to meet him and he actually painted the photo painting based on a photograph that he got from Rajadin Dayal, the court photographer. So in many cases you really have artists using techniques which probably came from Europe, saw the photographic case, saw the photographic print and then started using it and if they couldn't sort of uh, do the foreshortening and things, that's also when you catch the glitches in the painting. Because in a photograph, the image is taken in a certain way, and when you enlarge it to oil paint, without the photographic substrate that you see behind it, obviously it's not an enlargement. That's when they have to use their hand skills, and they tend to go wrong. I find that very often. Because the Indian uh, portrait painters were not trained in the tradition, uh, unlike the European paint, uh, portraitists who came here and painted. Of course, those things that you see, if you call wrong, premiere the punctum that makes yeah. it all. Right. Now the other ones which actually attract a lot of art historical attention because they're so unique and extraordinary in, in, in themselves and they tell us far more than what you know. Listen everybody, thank you very, very much for coming and thank you for speaking and introducing thank us to this rich body of work.